elder brother, the executive secretary of uh, the National University Commission, Professor Abu Bakr Adamu Rashid Yamanai, members of uh, his management team here present, our respected vice chancellors of uh, the federal universities in Nigeria. Permit me to recognize uh, some of you specifically. However, I have tremendous respect for all of you. Beginning with uh, my alma mater university, where I obtained my BTEC, MSc, and MBA from the same university, Professor Muhammad A. Abdul Aziz, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Abu Bakr Tafao Balewa University, Bauchi. I obtained my BTEC from there, my MSc from there, and also MBA from uh, the same university before I left Nigeria for the United Kingdom where I obtained my PhD. Furthermore, he taught me as an undergraduate student. He was my teacher for Physics 202. <laughs> and I could recall vividly, in the morning we were to write the paper and I fell sick. I was taken to university clinic and I was hospitalized there. So I wrote that examination on my hospital bed. And uh, most probably significant percentage of our students failed the course. And I was able to pass the course with a good grade. <laughs> Furthermore, I served in the same university for over 10 years. I was a programmer there, graduate assistant there, assistant lecturer there, lecturer two there, lecturer one there, before I left for International University of Medina. Secondly, my current vice chancellor, the Iron Lady, <laughs> uh, Professor Oti Inena, the vice chancellor of the Federal University of Technology, Oweri. As they say, once a teacher, always a teacher. The time I spend at the National Information Technology Development Agency, NITDA, as the DG, I was engaged with some academic institutions. I was also engaged with the uh, National Open University of Nigeria. They have given me an appointment on 24th April 2018, where we signed an MOU between NITDA on one hand and NAUN on the other. And all the PhD holders at NIDA were engaged by the university under my leadership where we developed the curriculum of uh, most of their ICT courses and we were engaged in teaching and supervision. And I was also engaged with Massachusetts Institute of Technology while in NIDA, particularly in the area of uh, Regional Acceleration Entrepreneurship Program, REAP where I served as the champion of MIT from 2019 to 2021. So she is my current vice chancellor. The way you report to ES, it is the same way I report to her. <laughs> Before the strike, I was also teaching. I taught in the first semester fundamental of software and I have been teaching in the second semester and I'm supervising PhD candidates in the area of uh, cyber security. So because of this, you may wish to address me sir and I will address you as sirs because I also report to one of you. It is because of that tremendous respect I have for you. By now I am supposed to be in the state house attending an event with the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for NNPC Limited that is going to be unveiled. But I tendered my apology. I say I'm about to address a gathering that I don't know how to apologize to them. So, most probably, 
it could be after this discussion that I will rush to the State House. If possible, I will be able to attend the completing part of uh, the program. And there and then we will have another meeting with Mr. President. And I know it involves our universities because from the composition of the committee, Minister of Education, Finance, Budget and National Planning, Minister of Labor and Employment, DG Budget Office, Accountant General, the acting, and my humble self, the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, I believe the issues to be discussed are related to the issues of our federal universities. And uh, I do hope that uh, it is going to be a fruitful. However, it is not yet in the public. It is out of respect. I have said it to you. And I know after the meeting, most probably, uh, our representatives are going to brief the media about the outcome of the meeting. Yesterday night, Minister of Finance reached out to me, and I learned that uh, he has led a delegation to her. And uh, this morning, also, Minister of Education, Mala Adamo Adamo, called me also to confirm the time for the meeting and to discuss one or two things. So all these things, I believe, are very relevant to why you are here. I am highly worried that I am addressing you at the time that our universities are not on session. I am highly worried because I know the role university occupies in our society when it comes to educating our younger ones, research and development, when it comes to job creation and uh, many more. I do hope that uh, a solution will be found as soon as possible. And I had the discussion you had with the Minister of Finance, Budget and the National Planning, my sister, Zainab Shamsuna Ahmad. And I do hope that from your discussion with her, the discussion with the Minister of Education, and I was informed even the State Minister of Education was here uh, yesterday. I do hope that uh, we will come together, discuss the issues objectively, and find a solution. Uh, and we are all stakeholders in it, and it is our collective responsibility to be honest, discuss the issues objectively, and find a solution. And I do hope a solution will be found uh, as soon as possible. So furthermore, with this explanation, most probably I don't have any question to answer. Any question, no. Any request, no. Any complaint, no. Are you comfortable and satisfied with my explanation? Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> so because of the respect I have for you, I asked the questions and I have answered them. So thank you very much. <laughs> And uh, secondly, as uh, my elder brother, the executive secretary of NUC has said, we have been discussing with him on how our sector, the ministry and the parastatals under the ministry, in fact, including the private sector, can support our universities. Looking at the lessons we have learned from COVID-19 pandemic, where in the developed countries and even some developing countries, Immediately, universities were switched to virtual learning, online teaching, and many more. But in Nigeria, most of our universities were locked up during COVID-19. It becomes necessary that we should learn some better and better lessons from COVID-19 and see how we can improve and make our universities to be uh, the center of learning in the real sense of uh, the word. I have so many discussions with him, and of recent, I presented a memo before the Federal Executive Council under the Nigerian Communications Commission, in which it was later approved. And I believe the significant part of that memo, most probably 60 to 70 percent of that will go to our universities. And as long as you see the name of your university, then definitely you are going to benefit significantly from it. Some of the universities could be able to benefit from free internet, unlimited, 
on all the campuses. Some of them we plan to build a world-class ICT parks for them, some digital economy parks, some even cyber security research centers in the universities. It's a huge amount of money that we dedicated in the sector from what we have generated and it was approved in the budget and the Federal Executive Council has approved that as part of our intervention to the academia. And I do hope that this is uh, good news. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, furthermore, before I was permitted to speak here, I engaged ES and I tried to reach out to him yesterday night or early morning around 2 a.m. to ask him what to say here. <laughs> because I was invited, no topic was given to me. And I didn't know what to say. So it becomes difficult. And even when he came in, I was pleading with him, please give me a direction in which you want me to address our vice chancellors of the federal universities. He said, no, you can just discuss about the relationship, maybe what between the sector and the universities on how we can uh, work together for the success of our country. So to me, this is not a topic <laughs> also. <laughs> it becomes difficult. It is not even a topic. But however, I may wish to say a word or two. Permit me just to comment on the digital economy policy and strategy, or rather the role of uh, our universities towards the implementation of uh, the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy for a Digital Nigeria. As most of you are very much aware, that when I was appointed as a minister and I assumed duty on the 21st August 2019, the first thing I did was to have an engagement with the CEOs of the parastatals under the supervision of the ministry NCC, NicheComsat, Galaxy, USPF, NIPOST, and NITDA, where I left. And what I discovered after the engagement, what was missing in the sector in Nigeria was digital economy. There was no any ministry coordinating digital economy. The then ministry was the ministry of uh, communications only. After that engagement, I came up with a proposal to His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari on the need to establish a ministry of a digital economy that will focus on job creation, supporting the economy of our country, and training our younger ones, not just to consider ICT for socialization, but rather ICT for revenue generation. As an example, Cristiano Ronaldo, a footballer that I know most of you know him even by name. What he was being paid in Real Madrid before moving to Juventus and finally to Manchester United. What he personally generates from Adivat only on his Instagram page was more than his salary and allowances being paid in all these clubs. And this is only on Instagram, excluding Facebook, Twitter, and the many more. And this is all about digital economy. But today, most of our younger ones, you will discover they spend time online without having any benefit from it. Sometimes they are online to cause disunity, to install this, to install there, to uh, insult this, to criticize this, to share fake news, and many more. While digital economy is beyond socialization using ICT, but rather to ensure that ICT is being deployed in order to achieve many benefits, including economic benefit. Mr. President allowed me to present a memo to him, and I have done so. And I was also directed to make a presentation before the Federal Executive Council on the need of having digital economy ministry. And this is what has been recommended by the World Economic Forum 
by European Union and many important organizations globally that each country is supposed to have that ministry. After the presentation, it was approved by Mr. President on the 17th October 2019. It was presented before the Federal Executive Council on 24th October, 23rd October 2019. And on 24th October 2019, we commenced the implementation of our digital economy in Nigeria. We developed the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy for a Digital Nigeria 2020-2030. That is from 2020 to 2030. And in that document we have developed, which was unveiled by His Excellency Mr. President on the 28th November 2019, has eight pillars. And academia has a critical role to play. This is one policy. We have so far developed 19 national policies in the sector. However, the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy with acronym INDEX, it is the umbrella of all the policies because it serves as the foundation on which all other national policies have been developed. <clears throat> Going through the policy, you will discover there are eight pillars. And in most of them, there is a critical role to play by the academia. And since in all these policies I have mentioned, 19 of them, in at least 16 of them, academia was significantly involved towards the development. Because the best model being used today is not for academia or private sector or industry to operate as stand alone but there is need for collaboration and partnership, like as it is in the triple helix model. There is need for academia, there is need for industry, and there is need for government, particularly the policy makers. They work together. And that is why the global best practice today, even academics are encouraged to go to either public offices or industry for their sabbatical and many more contrary to what we usually do, switching from one university to another university, teaching almost the same courses, but changing from university to public office like NUC or any other institutions or NCC, for example, or NITDA, or going to industry where you will have first-hand information. It will enrich your knowledge and make you a multidisciplinary scholar than staying in on only one lane. And this is the global best practice today. In INDEX, that policy, we have eight pillars. Pillar number one is developmental regulation, in which universities that have law department has a critical role. They have a critical role to play. Two, digital literacy and skills. Pillar number three is solid infrastructure, broadband penetration, data centers, and many more. Pillar number four is a service infrastructure, like the e-commerce, online activities, and the many more. Pillar number five is digital uh, services, promotion, and development. Pillar number six is solid infrastructure. Pillar number seven is digital society and emerging technologies. Pillar number eight is indigenous content, development, and promotion. <laughs> These are the eight pillars in the index. And if you look at them critically, you will discover that in each and every pillar, universities have a role to play. Digital economy is the leading economy today in the world. The word digital economy was coined in 1995 by Don Tapscott in his best-selling book entitled as Digital Economy, The Promise and Peril. In that book in 1995, he coined the word digital economy. He attached that adjective to the word economy. And since then, as at yesterday night by 10 p.m. when I search, that is on 18 July 2022, Google search engine brought about 700 under 84 million words of a digital economy. This is to show to us that this has been accepted globally. 
According to Oxford Economist, digital economy was globally embraced significantly by 2016. That is six years ago. And at that time, the value of the digital economy was 11.5 trillion USD. And it comprised a minimum of 15.5% of the global economy. Furthermore, in Africa, according to McKenzie, the value of digital economy prior to COVID-19 was over 300 billion USD. And according to the recent research by the Digital Cooperation Organization, by 2023, the value of digital economy globally could be over 30% of the world economy. Furthermore, according to the World Economic Forum, by the end of 2022 this year, the value of digital economy could be a minimum of 60% of the entire world economy. This is to show to us how digital economy is dominating the world. Our case study here in Nigeria, during COVID-19, the country went into recession because pre prior to that, the country largely depended on oil and gas. And oil and gas recorded minus when it comes to GDP contribution. The sector that played the critical role in lifting out our country out of recession with all sense of humility was the digital economy sector. It is the fastest growing economy during COVID-19, particularly in 2020. If you look at the last quarter of 2020, it was the only sector that grew by double digits, 14.70%. And if you add the remaining sectors from second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth combined together, their growth rate combined together was not up to that of the digital sector, digital economy sector alone. During that time, we recorded the highest contribution of ICT sector to our digital economy, to, to our GDP. Just the ICT sector without the digital services. The digital services could probably be higher than even the ICT sector contribution to GDP. At that time, we recorded 17.92% contribution to our GDP, the highest ever in the history of Nigeria as a country and the highest ever in the history of the sector in Nigeria. So there are so many good news coming out from the sector. And a lot has also been achieved in the sector. And there are so many opportunities for job creation within the sector. And we can learn from other countries. For example, in the US, in the United States of America, by 2017, digital economy sector contributed 5.1 million jobs in the country within just uh, that period of time. In China, in 2018, digital economy sector contributed 191 million jobs. 199 million jobs in the country. In Nigeria, we have a success story where the digital economy has been creating many jobs for our citizens, particularly through our partnership between the government on one hand and the private sector on the other. Even during COVID-19 pandemic, we established two virtual academies, one directly under the ministry and the second one was given to the National Information Technology Development Agency to manage. Through COVID lockdown only, we trained over 500,000 Nigerians on emerging technologies cyber security, artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, cloud computing, biotechnology, and the many more. And that has been achieved through our partnership with the global tech giants like IBM, Cisco, Microsoft Corporation, Huawei Technologies, and uh, 
many more. And most of them, we have an MOU with them, where government partners with them to ensure that we support our citizens and our institutions in delivering that. Of recent, we signed an MOU with Huawei Technologies, where they will establish a minimum of 300 Huawei's, Huawei academies in Nigeria. And most of them will be in our higher institutions of learning. And we, in that MOU, part of its agreement, we are going to train our citizens, particularly in academia, with advanced knowledge in area of ICT, particularly skills development. A minimum of 30,000 are going to benefit. And it is like train the trainers. And uh, I do hope that uh, when our universities are open, we will immediately commence the implementation of uh, that MOU is ready for implementation. In addition to many MOUs and partnership we have, the same with Microsoft. Recently, I was visited by the president of uh, Microsoft, President Brad Smith from the US. Part of our discussion, they promised to train five million Nigerians on ICT, skills on training. And I believe, based on my background, the beneficiaries are going to be our higher institutions of learning, particularly our universities, and particularly our federal universities. <laughs> Furthermore, I have few thoughts to share with you. It could be my opinion, but I do hope it is important with the privilege I have to discuss with you to address some of the challenges I have observed, particularly after occupying office as the DG Nitida and then the Minister of uh, Communications, then and later the Minister of uh, Communications and the first ever of digital economy with all sense of humility. Some of the challenges I earlier discussed with the ES, and uh, I believe the Minister of Education, uh, the Federal Minister of Education, and also the NUC are working on that. That is, there is need for a holistic approach to review our curriculum, to review all our curricula in university, particularly in the area of science engineering and technology. The earlier we do that, the better for us. If you look at it today globally, soft skills are more respected and they are sought after more than any other skill. Soft skills are more important today than the hard skills. Hard skills accommodate hands-on, maybe on ICT, on cyber security, on robotics, and many more. But soft skills, like critical thinking, like analytical thinking, like collaborative skills, like project management, like creativity, and many more, they are more respected globally. And this is what employers all over the world are looking for. If you apply for any job today in the global tech giants, they hardly ask you your degree or your MSc or your PhD. In fact, Deloitte recently proposed that outside academia, outside academia, it is advisable if we focus more on soft skills to the extent that it was proposed that even to, to include a column for your educational qualification on your CV is no more required. They are not in any way undermining educational qualification, but any educational qualification that has not been validated by skills, then the aim of acquiring it has been defeated because degree is supposed to be a validation of the skills you have acquired. So if that degree has failed to validate, then the aim of acquiring it has been defeated. 
So our objective is not just to obtain a degree, but in the course of obtaining degree, let us ensure that we acquire the trainings and skills that are required. If we can reconcile both, I have a degree and I also have the skills, that is the best. But if only one is to be considered, then priority and preference should be given to the skills rather than empty qualification. And this is a major challenge that we are experiencing in Nigeria. Most of our undergraduates and even postgraduates, they are more passionate about just obtaining degree without focusing more on the trainings being provided in the university. Just a simple example, if you can tell a student, I will give you B, if that is allowed. I will just give you B. You don't need to come to the class, you will not even go. Because he attends lectures just because of that prerequisite that I must attend this course and pass before I proceed to the next level. It is only because of that. But what, so because of this, we need a, 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 an orientation that what is important is the skills being provided. Today, if you want to apply to Microsoft Corporation, I have recently written a book, Skills Rather Than Just Degrees, is in the process of uh, being reviewed. The foreword of the book was written by the president of uh, Microsoft himself, Professor Brad Smith. When he read the book, he reached out to me. He said that I'm glad that you have documented this. And I'm also glad that you have written this book. He said, after reading your book, I discovered that now I know more than before. And this is the president of Microsoft Corporation in the US. And the whole book is not in any way undermining degrees, but showing that there are more opportunities when you obtain the skills than just obtaining a degree without skills. Many graduates today, engineering, ICT courses, and many more, if they are employed in government, you will discover they just become administrative staff. Any technical work, you need to go at tech, I get a technologist or somebody who did not attend the university with hands-on training to come and fix your computer center. There is a line of demarcation between those of us with PhD in ICT and those with hands-on training. It's a clear line of demarcation. While the opportunities are there for people with skills, and this is indeed very important. I know one of the challenges we are being confronted in Nigeria is funding. There is no doubt about this. Funding is one of the major challenges. And if our universities will focus more on skills, definitely we will be able to support government in addressing the challenge of funding. Because by providing skills, we will be able to come up with so many solutions you will discover we will come up with so many world-class startups that will make us proud. As I earlier said, I serve as the champion of uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the U.S. for two years. However, my engagement with them on skills provision, entrepreneurship, and innovation is ongoing, but I have completed my term for, as a champion for two years. Part of what I learned through my engagement with them is the way and manner they develop their curriculum for each and every course, and the way students are engaged. You will discover that this is just a university, but they are serial entrepreneurs. Collectively, their GDP is more than that of India as a country. The serial entrepreneurs of MIT as a university as of 2016, their collective GDP was around 2 trillion USD. And at that time, India was 1.9 trillion USD. So that university, the GDP as of 2016, is more than four times the GDP of Nigeria as of today, not in 2016. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so by implication, it, it could be even more than the GDP of uh, Africa. Because Lagos alone today, if Lagos were to be a country, the GDP of Lagos could be the sixth highest GDP in Africa. As at today, the GDP of Lagos is more than that of Kenya. It's more than that of Ethiopia with over 100 million people. Why? Because of that dominance of skills and tech giants and many more in Lagos. There was a research entitled MIT Nation. If MIT University were to be a nation today, it will be the ninth or the tenth largest economy globally. And if you look at the way students are being taught, you will discover that the whole focus is not just about to graduate and become an employee, but rather to graduate and become an employer. That is the target, just to become an employer. So their passion, their interest is not just to graduate and start rooming about looking for jobs. Their passion is when you graduate, you become an entrepreneur immediately. That is why their focus is what they call IDE, innovation driven enterprises. Innovation driven enterprises. They focus more on two things, digital innovation and digital entrepreneurship. And this is just a university. There is a similar one that is IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology. It's another good example. If you look at the design of IIT in India, it's very similar to MIT. In the course of writing that book, I was just conducting a research of the CEOs of the global tech giants globally. And I discovered that in ICT, more than 80% of the CEOs are either graduates of IIT India or an institution that is affiliated to IIT India. Most of them, they are from that institution. To the extent that one graduate of IIT India is averagely an employer of 100 people globally. One graduate. So today, we complain about the problem of unemployment in Nigeria. I strongly agree there is an unemployment problem. However, the most worrisome is not an unemployment, but unemployability. Unemployability is the major challenge when it comes to science, technology, and engineering. Where a student will graduate, but he will not be able to deliver hands-on any assignment given to him with regards to his area of study. This is the major challenge. I don't want to mention names or institutions. The time I spent in government, in NITDA, almost three years, as a minister today, almost three years, I have learned a lot. That definitely, the earlier we address the challenge of unemployability, the better for us. And the only way to address the challenge of unemployability is through prioritizing skills in our teachings and the many more. There are so many models. If it is university, MIT is a good model. IIT is another model in which I encourage our respected vice chancellors to look into their teachings and many more. And I believe there are many beneficial lessons for our country and also for our universities. So the issue of unemployability is more worrisome. If a student, a citizen graduates from a university, as long as he has skills, then let him not look at only the border of Nigeria. The opportunities are out there. Of recent, based on, just because of COVID-19, around 161 million new jobs had been created globally. The whole world population now is around 7.8 to 7.9 billion. In Nigeria, is around 220, 210 to 220 million. And Africa is 1.3 billion. 
So by implication, if you look at the world population and the total number of jobs created just because of COVID-19, you will discover that if this is to be shared averagely, Nigeria will have at least 5 million jobs. But why our citizens fail to utilize the opportunities globally? Because of lack of skills. Even social skills are missing with most of our students. Just to see people that are kind to you, thank you, can I help you? You enter somewhere, you are a student behind you, hold the door for him. This is social skills, just how to interact with people. Even that one is missing. A student will come to the vice chancellor not knowing how to say, good morning, sir. Some will address you like his colleague or his driver because his father is financially okay. He doesn't think that anyone is supposed to be respected. That is the problem. So even social skills on how to interact with human beings is missing. And this is worrisome. Because when you encounter somebody, the way you interact with him, that impression is the one that will stay for long with him. It will last long. And it remains for a long period of time. That impression, the way you smile, the way you appreciate it, you just encounter him. Can I help you, please? It's just as simple. But it means a lot to him. So we need to focus more on social skills for our students, soft skills, critical thinking. Look at this Gmail. It's one of the most robust emails today. And it's a product of critical thinking. It's a product of critical thinking. Just a, 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 a homework was given to the employees of uh, Google that by tomorrow you should come up, go and partake in critical thinking and come up with a solution that will help people globally. Just an employee come up with Gmail account. Within 24 hours he came up with it. Critical thinking is key. Sometimes to identify a problem and come up with a solution is even more important than bringing the solution. Just identify the problem is enough. You cannot do that without critical thinking. Today, the largest e-commerce platform in the world is Amazon. Amazon is the largest, but today Amazon doesn't have one shop where they sell any property any commodity, but they are the largest and the richest in the world. Jeffrey Bezos, for over four years, he was the most richest man in the world. Why? Because of providing Amazon platform, and they didn't have one shop. They only bring together potential buyers and potential sellers to interact, and that made them to be the richest in the world. Today, the biggest and the largest taxi company in the world is Uber, but Uber doesn't have one taxi car today. They don't have it, no single, and they are the largest. And what they generate because of that critical thinking and providing the solution, no any taxi institution or company can generate that. So look at the critical thinking. Mark Zuckerberg, when he came up with his startup of Facebook at that time, a company approached him, wanted to buy, with around 200 million USD. He decided not to. In fact, he was contemplating. He approached Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple. So he said, this is my dilemma. What is your advice? He said, I will not advise you. What you only need to do is to find time and think. So he gave him only three words. He said, travel, disconnect and reflect. So he traveled from the US to India. He disconnected from people and he reflected. He came back and decided not to sell. Sometimes what you need to do is just to isolate yourself and think. Sometimes if you remain on campus, you will not have time. Just operational issues will not even allow you to think. When you travel to Abuja or to any other country, you will discover that you sometimes think better than when you are on campus. So critical thinking is important. Our 
students will be able to come up with world-class solutions if they partake in critical thinking. One of our citizens in Nigeria, he graduated from university here, he couldn't get any job. He traveled to the U.S. He came up with a solution. When he stayed in one com environment, he discovered a challenge with regards to identifying homes and locations. So he came up with something like local map. Later, he expanded that map. He was approached by Apple to buy the product. He left Nigeria without employment. Apple bought his solution at the price of one billion USD. One billion USD. The name of the solution is HubSpot. One billion USD. If you go to IIT India, when a student is enrolled into the university, he will be advised in science, engineering, or technology to come up with a startup, just a small company. You should start thinking on your own company what you want to be. So you come up with your solution, either in fintech, either in e-commerce, either in cybersecurity, either in security. So throughout, from first year to your graduation, you are working on your company. By the time you graduate, then your company is ready. So throughout your period, you are working on your startup, and you are trying to make sure that your startup provides a solution, either a local one or within your country or a global one. And this is something that I think is very important. And the earlier we address that skills gap, the better for us and the better for our graduates. And I think as university vice chancellors, you have a critical role to support our executive secretary. They have reached advanced stage, I know, of reviewing that. It was mentioned by the Minister of Education in one of uh, the memos he presented at the Federal Executive Council. And just more than a month ago, I was with the EAS also in another program where that was mentioned. It is not just about developing the curriculum. Let us ensure that we train and retrain our staff, both academic and non-academics, so that that can be implemented. Because without that, it becomes difficult for even that one to be implemented. Curriculum cannot implement itself. There must be people with requisite skills so that it can be implemented effectively. I am not here for any lecture. Hey. I'm just here for a talk. <laughs> so <laughs> there is no way a student can lecture his teachers. I sincerely apologize. I am not here for a lecture. I am just here just to remind you about what you know better than all of us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.